In our discussion on skeletal muscle cells and the regulation of glycogen breakdown, we ultimately said that to initiate the process of glycogen breakdown, phosphorylase B has to be transformed into phosphorylase A. And that's because it's phosphorylase A that predominates in the R state, the relaxed state that is fully active. And once we form phosphorylase A, this enzyme basically initiates step one of glycogen breakdown. Now, we also said that the enzyme that catalyzes this step is known as phosphorylase kinase. So ultimately, what phosphorylase kinase does is it takes all phosphoryl groups from two ATP molecules and places them onto serine residues found on phosphorylase B, and that creates phosphorylase A. Now, the question that I'd like to address in this lecture is, what exactly activates phosphorylase kinase? What exactly allows this molecule to carry out this process in the first place? So, once again, phosphorylase kinase is the enzyme that catalyzes the conversion of phosphorylase B in the T state into phosphorylase A, which predominates in the R state. But what exactly activates this phosphorylase kinase? Well, before we look at that question, let's actually discuss what the structure of phosphorylase kinase actually is. Well, the structure of this kinase actually consists of four different types of subunits, four different types of polypeptide chains. We have the alpha, the beta, the gamma, and the delta. And we actually have four of each type. So this is what the structure looks like. So we have four beta shown in orange. We have these four gamma, the four delta, and the four alpha. Now, only these green structures, the gamma structures, actually have catalytic activity, and these green structures are the ones that are responsible for catalyzing this particular step. But the other three subunits basically have regulatory abilities, and as we'll discuss in just a moment, it's the beta subunits and the delta subunits which are ultimately responsible for fully activating the phosphorylase kinase. So during times of rapid and sudden strenuous activity, we know that our body begins producing and releasing hormones into our bloodstream. And what these hormones ultimately do is they allow our body, they allow the cells of our body to actually activate these beta subunits. And they activate the beta subunits by attaching phosphoryl groups. So when we release the hormones, that ultimately basically phosphorylates these four beta subunits to form the following structure. Now, although this structure does contain partial activity, it is not yet fully functional. And to transform this molecule into a fully functional enzyme that can basically catalyze this particular reaction, what must happen is calcium ions must bind to these red structures. These red structures are the delta structures, and the delta structures are actually calmodulin proteins. Remember that calmodulin is a protein that can sense calcium ions. It can bind calcium ions. So in skeletal muscle tissue, when we contract, the calcium ion stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum is basically released into the cytoplasm. And once inside the cytoplasm, the calcium ions can basically bind onto these red structures. And once the calcium ions bind onto the red structures, that transforms this partially active enzyme into the fully active phosphorylase kinase. And only now can this structure actually carry out this process will, uh, with full activity. So we see that in order for phosphorylase kinase to actually initiate this process, which in turn initiates glycogen breakdown, this molecule itself must be initiated and it is initiated by two different processes. The phosphorylation of these beta subunits as well as the binding of the calcium ions on these red delta structures, the, calmod the calmodulin subunits. 